Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Historical Society's Box Lunch Talk. We are thrilled today to be featuring our wonderful historian, uh, Mimi Ashcraft. Um, before I introduce Mimi, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. This is being recorded. We're so thankful to the Community Media Center for their partnership in capturing Mimi's talk. So I ask that you all mute your audio and your video. And if you have questions during Mimi's presentation, she will, um, we will capture, you can use the chat function at the bottom and she will be happy to answer your questions at the end. But for the program, please mute your audio and your video uh, at this time. And again, if you're wondering who I am, I'm Lynn Wheeler, the uh, program uh, committee chair for the Historical Society. And I'm thrilled with all the hearty souls who have agreed to present on Zoom as we've uh, become very ingenious during this year. I again want to thank the uh, Community Media Center for their tremendous partnership and expertise. We're thrilled that this is not only being recorded, but it is going to be shown on their channels and streamed, and you can find it uh, on Facebook. Um, we want to thank the nonprofits. We are uh, coming to you from there today. They have a wonderful facility. We're very thankful for their partnership. Before I introduce you, I want to uh, announce a few events that are coming up that I know you'll find interesting. On Saturday, January 23rd, this coming Saturday, we will have uh, Kevin Dayhoff as our keynote speaker for the Carroll County birthday party. That's at two o'clock on Saturday on Zoom. I hope you can join us. You can register. And there's Kevin right now coming in to join us. But you can register for that at the Historical Society website. Um, on, on Saturday, February 13th, we're very excited to be having a wine tasting via Zoom. But you can pick up your wine at Jeannie Bird Bakery Baking Company. And Bernie is going to through Cote Rome, Wines of Cote Rome. We hope you can join us for that. And on Tuesday, February 16th, we have we are honored to have Bert Camaral, director of Maryland's Four Centuries Project, very connected with the Maryland uh, Center for History and Culture. And he will be doing our box lunch talk on, um, on caregivers during the Civil War. And I think that will of course be very interesting. And now I ask you again, if you haven't, to please turn your mics and your video off. And I'm going to ask Mimi to turn hers on so that I can have the great uh, opportunity to introduce her. Um, I'm sure Mimi or Mary Ann, as you see her in the paper, needs no introduction to history lovers in Carroll County. Mimi is a lifelong student of history. She retired from the Carroll County Public Library, I'm honored to say, uh, before beginning her second volunteer career with the Historical Society of Carroll County. A research and writing career with that HSCC that has covered nearly 20 years. Her work includes the regular Carroll Yesterday's columns in the Carroll County Times, which I know we're, uh, we all enjoy reading. In fact, one of my favorite recent series was on the uh, notorious bank heist in New Windsor in 1860. So Mimi, thank you so much for continuing to keep us connected with the interesting history of Carroll County. Uh, Mimi is also an author. I'm gonna hold up a book that she wrote. Uh, her co-author is David uh, Barr. And it's on the Westminster Cemetery. And um, this year, um, Mimi gave a wonderful tour of the cemetery. It was fabulous for those of you who had the chance to go on it, you will agree. And we're hoping to talk Mimi into doing it again, but this is a fabulous comprehensive look at the cemetery available at the gift shop at the Historical Society. And we hope we can get Mimi to do it again. And I know she'll be happy to autograph that for you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn off my video and audio and turn it on to and turn it over to Mimi. 
Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Lynn, for that nice introduction. Um, I'm going to start the share screen, hopefully, um, and we will see where we go from here. Um, okay, welcome. Um, this has been a very interesting project that I have uh, been involved with um, over the course of the pandemic. And uh, I've had a lot of help from people. There are a lot of people in the community that know a great deal about um, Carroll County's uh, Black soldiers in the Civil War. But we are going to uh, start with what information I've put together. And here are some of the people who have helped me uh, and the resources that, that I have used. So let's begin at the beginning. Uh, when the Civil War broke out in April of 1861, there were no African-American servicemen uh, serving in the United States Army. And over the course of the four years, uh, that went from no men to about 178,000 men, uh, which represented about a one-tenth of the uh, Union Army in the four years. 175 regiments, each of about a um, thousand men. The uh, enthusiasm for the war uh, in the North was, was tremendous and uh, men began flocking uh, to the idea of enlisting in the army. And some black men did as well. In New York City, there were men who had rented a hall and started drilling, uh, but the police shut them down. And something similar happened in Boston. Uh, so it still was a white man's war, pretty much. Um, there were some soldiers from the uh, Union who were operating in this, on the southeast coast of the United States in the, in the Carolinas, um, who were using a few of the free or uh, escaped black uh, men who joined the uh, operation of the, of the Union Army down there on the Southeast coast. Uh, they were called contraband. Uh, and we see a picture on the right hand side of your screen here um, of some of them in a sort of uh, motley array of, of uniforms or non-uniforms, uh, but they were serving as teamsters in the, um, in the Union Army uh, operating on the Southeast coast. And <clears throat> up in the right hand corner, if you can see it, is a picture of Gideon Wells, who was the Secretary of the Navy. That was the first place where Union troops uh, or <clears throat> uh, Black soldiers were able to serve in the Union effort for the war. Um, they were enlisted uh, starting in September of 1861. They were paid uh, $10 a month and given one meal a day, but that was uh, the first effort. By 1862, the war was still, of course, going on, heating up. Uh, losses in the Union Army were uh, mounting up and certainly the enthusiasm for the war uh, was, was uh, lessening. Uh, the men who had enlisted for a hundred days uh, were not, uh, either had to re-enlist or were not in use, uh, but recruitment certainly was becoming more difficult. Uh, in April of 1862, Lincoln emancipated the District of Columbia slaves but altogether, the United States, the Northern uh, troops were beginning to realize, or actually the Union Army was beginning to realize the potential manpower uh, that was available if African Americans were involved in the war. The Battle of Antietam that took place in the middle of September of 1862 uh, proved that uh, although it was a, a Union win, it was uh, a very costly battle. And Abraham Lincoln decided that it was, it was probably time that on the 1st of January of 1863, he would issue an Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves in the states that had seceded. 
But um, of course, Maryland had not seceded. It was a slave state, so was Delaware, so was Kentucky, and so was Missouri. As 1863 dawned and Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, I found it rather interesting that the New York Times uh, considered it a military action on Lincoln's part and not a moral action in terms of abolishing slavery. But in the very beginning of January, uh, or actually by about the 20th of January, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry was being formed that is the famous uh, uh, regiment that fought at Fort Wagner uh, off the, the coast of Charleston, South Carolina. The one that was mentioned in the movie Glory um, that was featured in the movie Glory. There was also a, a regiment in Kansas that, that began very early in 1863. But uh, the new man uh, in charge of the uh, war effort, Edward Stanton, began formation of the Bureau of Colored Troops in May of 1863. And with that enlistment of black soldiers started in earnest. Uh, black soldiers, when the, uh, with the start of their enlistment, were paid at a different rate than the white soldiers. It was $6 less. And the image that you see on the right hand side of your screen uh, down below in remarks, it says that for this man whose name was Washington Smith, um, that uh, when pay is due, he should be getting the difference between $7, which was the um, pay for, for black soldiers and $13, which was the pay for white soldiers. So <clears throat> that was eventually settled by 1864, but originally it was, was lower. So the black soldiers um, in their regiments only could achieve the rank of sergeant, uh, private um, <clears throat> corporal or sergeant, uh, and any officer higher than that was a white officer. So in addition to enlisting uh, black soldiers, they had to recruit white officers for these uh, units. The response by the Confederacy to the use of black soldiers as combatants was what you might expect. Uh, they, were, they were very um, upset by the whole thing. And in fact, uh, they, said dire consequences would come to anyone captured either white or black. Um, and uh, in fact, it, you'll see uh, an instance where something similar did happen. Recruitment began in Maryland um, in uh, about July of 1863. Maryland, Missouri, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky were the contributors of the largest number of, of enlistees in the United States Colored Troop. And here on the right-hand side, you see the uh, tattered but nicely restored as well as they could flag of the fourth US Colored Troops, which was one of the regiments that had a lot of Carroll County men. Uh, this flag is now down at the Maryland Center for History and Culture, which is the same as the Maryland Historical Society. So the first uh, of the uh, federally organized uh, colored troops was enlisting men from the District of Columbia, Frederick and Howard County, but the fourth Maryland, I mean, the fourth US colored troop um, was the one where uh, there were a majority, almost everyone was from uh, Maryland, somewhere in Maryland. But uh, as you see at the bottom, troubles were rising. And that was because Maryland was still a slave state, just like Delaware, uh, Kansas, and, I mean, <clears throat> Kentucky and Missouri. So Lincoln was very concerned that Maryland would not uh, try to secede. He wanted to keep it in the Union. Uh, William Burney, General William Burney was appointed by Governor Stanton, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Secretary of War Stanton uh, to be in charge of recruitment in the state of Maryland. Um, and they began recruiting um, 
quite quite effectively. And in fact, um, this man, John Krieger, uh, was so zealous in his recruiting in Carroll and Frederick counties that he was seized and thrown into jail uh, in Frederick and allowed to sit there for a while. Meanwhile, uh, Lincoln had said uh, to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, uh, work out something with the Maryland governor, Governor Bradford, uh, so that we don't uh, have so many disgruntled people in the state of Maryland. And the reason they were disgruntled uh, is, of course, from the slaveholders' point of view, it was uh, they were afraid that they would have slaves running off to enlist in the in the army and be paid. And uh, from the standpoint of small farmers, they were used to hiring free black men to help with, with the harvesting and the planting. So you had two groups of people who were unhappy. Um, but eventually Stanton and Bradford did work out a solution. And that was that the slave owners were uh, paid compensated up to $300 for the slaves uh, that they were willing to uh, allow, willing to uh, enlist in the, uh, in the army. It's been, it's been quite a challenge to try to identify all the Carroll County soldiers um, who uh, are in the various military records. Uh, we've used all sorts of, of places to find their names and newspapers and so on and so forth, mostly in fold three, uh, the military records. And there have been about 125 uh, men, actually not just soldiers, but also sailors, uh, that I found to date that at some point, either when they were born or after the war or whatever, they have a connection to Carroll County. Uh, most of them were enlisted in the 4th and 30th U.S. colored troops, but uh, as you'll see, there are some who, who were in other, record, uh, other regiments as well. Um, here, uh, this Nicholas Harden on the right-hand side, you can see that he actually uh, was born in Westminster, Maryland, uh, but he was enlisted in Washington and he was in the first US colored troop. Here are three uh, records uh, which give you a little idea of, of the challenges that are involved in trying to identify some of these men. On the left-hand side is Abraham Thomas, um, who was a, a member of the 4th U.S. Colored Troop. Uh, when asked where he was born, someone wrote down Carlisle County, Maryland. Uh, well, so what do, you, what do you do with a fellow like this? Uh, he was a farmer. Uh, was he from Carlisle, Pennsylvania? Was this supposed to be Carroll County? Was it supposed to be Caroline County? You don't really know, uh, but I threw him in with the Carroll County uh, group. Um, in the middle is Ephraim Smith, um, who was 42 years old, you see. He enlisted in the 28th U.S. Uh, Colored Infantry. Actually, he was drafted into the uh, 28th. Uh, he says clearly he was born in Carroll County. Uh, his occupation is a carpenter. But at age 42, he was definitely one of the older men. It also is a bit of a challenge here because it says he enlisted August 6th of 1865, and yet he was drafted and appointed sergeant on August 10th of 1864. So somebody has made a mistake somewhere along the line. Um, and S uh, Stephen Little, uh, whose image is on the right-hand side, uh, was 36 when he enlisted. He clearly was born in Carroll County and was a laborer. And most of the men um, that you will see, or that I saw, uh, when they enlisted and named their occupation, uh, especially from Carroll and Frederick counties. They were farmers or laborers, but you also have a number of other occupations um, and certainly blacksmiths would be a very handy uh, group of men to have in the, uh, in the army. Um, carpenters, uh, cooks, um, 
you have you have a wide range of of occupations, uh, but primarily farmers and laborers. This is a picture that that's quite famous, um, and it is the one company of the US, fourth U.S. Colored Troops that was taken outside of Washington. Uh, the man on your left, the the far left in this picture, is the the sergeant, and he has has a sword and you can see the, the red sash that he would have, have worn as the, the sergeant. All of these men look to be in brand spanking new uniforms. Uh, and uh, so I don't know the, the whole story behind this group of men, but um, it, it does show a, a, a of, of the uh, fourth US colored troops. After the men got their initial uh, training, uh, they had a number of roles that they could play besides it, actually as combatants in the, in the army. Uh, some of them were involved in construction of, of fortifications, in, in trench digging and engineering of various sorts. There were so many wagon trains, uh, wagons used in the uh, in the army that having teamsters was was also uh, something that men could do. Cooks, um, guard duty. Uh, certainly, we know some of the Maryland men were on guard duty at Point Lookout, the prisoner of war camp down in St. Mary's County. Um, one man who, whose record I'll show you later was a guard at a smallpox hospital in, in, uh, uh, in his, his time in the service. But m many of the men in their non-combat time were digging the Dutch Gap Canal. And that was uh, done on part of the James River between Richmond and uh, Petersburg. It was a, a huge operation that was started in the summer of 1864, involved a lot of the African American troops, and uh, it was very hard labor. They were given a little bit of extra pay uh, for the work, but uh, I don't know how much, and my guess would be it probably was no more than one or two dollars uh, a month but they were under fire from a Confederate artillery uh, battery, which was not very far away. So it was very dangerous work besides very hard work and done in the summer of 1864. On the right-hand side here, you see a, a picture of some of the uh, uh, pickets who would be supporting uh, and defending the, the workers who were, were doing the uh, hard digging. I mentioned what happened uh, or what was threatened by the Confederates if someone were captured, uh, a, either a, an African-American soldier or one of the commanding officers of the uh, colored troops. And here we have what may have happened to James Henry Luby, uh, who was a Carroll County man in the 4th US Colored Troop. If you look at the arrow under remarks, it says taken prisoner, August 17th, 1864, has never been exchanged or heard from, supposed to be dead. Uh, so my impression is that he probably was captured and, uh, and executed, although he could have been, um, it could have just died. Men were also um, not only enlisted or given the opportunity to enlist, but they also were drafted. And here we see an example of an 1863 composed draft list for uh, Maryland's fourth congressional district, uh, men whose surnames began with P. Um, and um, of the men listed here, six men, uh, two of them were colored, uh, four of them were white. Their jobs or their occupations were as laborers or farmers. Um, their age uh, was, was rather young, anywhere between 21 and, and 29. Um, and some of them were married, some of them were unmarried. Uh, but 
um, pointing to uh, Joshua Paraway, and he was one uh, man who definitely it was one of the uh, men who served in the US colored troops from Maryland. So now let's, let's take a look at some of these local soldiers and, and sailors from Carroll County. They're, they're a very interesting lot of men and interesting stories. Some of them are tragic. Some of them are uh, very inspiring. And uh, so the last two names on this list, Simon Murdoch and David Brown, we're going to talk about as people who achieved things after the war, but we'll start with uh, John Coates. John Coates was from uh, the Tawny Town area. He had a brother who also enlisted in the US Colored Troops. But John Coates uh, Company, um, I of the second US Colored Troop was assigned uh, after they went through training to be sent to Fort Jackson in um, New Orleans, out, just outside of New Orleans. And when he arrived there, he became very aware uh, that uh, the men serving uh, the, the other U.S. Uh, colored troop uh, men were very angry at the way they were being treated by their white officers. They were so, so angry that on the 9th of December of 1863, they mutinied. And because John Coates was a sergeant and not in one of the regiments that mutinied, he was court marshals, marshaled for not suppressing the mutiny. What did that mean to him? It meant that he was sentenced to serve one year in, in jail. Uh, he lost his rank. He was demoted from sergeant down to private. He lost all of his pay. Uh, he would be put on rations every other month uh, for, for 14 days, eating just bread and water. And where he was sent was Fort Jefferson off the coast of uh, Key West, Florida. Fort Jefferson is the same place that Dr. Mudd was sent when uh, he was sentenced after he had set John Wilkes Booth's leg um, as he was escaping after assassinating President Lincoln. So John Coates actually, thank goodness, did survive. I, I found him in the census, living in Baltimore, uh, the 1870 census. So he, he survived this treatment um, and um, I can't find him after uh, 1870. We have another man um, who was in the 4th U.S. Colored Troops, Alan Toop. Um, there were four men with the surname Toop from Carroll County who served uh, during the Civil War. Not a single one of them came home. And uh, so maybe right here there is need to mention that uh, the casualty rate uh, was was much uh, higher in the among the African American troops than it was among the white troops. It was about 35% higher. Uh, so about two of every uh, 10 men in the US colored troops did not come home. And Alan Toop was one of them. He was killed in action uh, at the Battle of Newmarket Heights, which took place uh, between Frederick's uh, between uh, Petersburg and Richmond. It was one of the more famous battles in which uh, the colored troops were, were very well represented. And um, there were actually 14 men who were given medals of honor as a result of their action during the Battle of New Market Heights. But Alan Toop was not one of them. He was killed and uh, killed in 1864. In the center uh, image, you see that his mother was uh, 81 years old when she finally received a check for $2,100 approximately uh, as the pension that she was due for having lost a son in the, in the war. Uh, 
I've included John Squirrel in this uh, group of men uh, because I think it's it's exciting to to know how much information you really can find about some of these men. Uh, first of all, John Squirrel's grave is not very far from my house. You see a picture of his tombstone. Uh, right below and to the left of it, you see that it, that tombstone was supplied by a company in West Rutland, Vermont. Uh, so, so here you have uh, just extra little tidbits of information. Uh, it also shows on the left-hand side under the company muster roll that he was stationed at Point Lookout on duty as a guard uh, at the uh, prisoner of war camp. And on the right-hand side, you see that John Squirrel um, was mustered out at Corpus Christi, Texas. So he, he got to see uh, quite a bit more of the world than most men in, in Carroll County who did not serve in the war. Um, anywhere from someplace in Virginia, the Carolina coast, um, or, or all the way over to Texas. He was also a substitute, so he did not enlist uh, necessarily, but was, uh, was a substitute for someone who did not want to serve in the war and paid to get out of service, and he was the substitute uh, for that gentleman. The records for Philip McLean are, are very interesting here. Um, you can see he had quite a long life. He was in the 4th U.S. Colored Troop. Uh, he began life as, as a slave of someone uh, named John Gorsuch living in the Woolleries District. He was wounded at another of the well-known battles in which colored troops participated. Uh, that was the Battle of Baylor's Farm, uh, which took place actually between June 15th and June 18th of 1864. It was the first real taste of heavy duty battle that these men uh, encountered um, in, the, uh, in the area around Petersburg and Richmond. The men uh, were, were green as far as, as battle tested uh, was concerned. They ended up, however, receiving uh, lots of honors from their commanding officers for their courage in the face of really withering uh, firepower. And on the 15th of June, they did accomplish what they were asked to do, but uh, the battle raged three more days, and uh, Lee and was able to hold off the Union Army and the siege of Petersburg, which started in mid-June of 1864, continued until April of 1865. But on the right-hand side here, you see that uh, Philip McLean was injured. Uh, with a gunshot wound to the left-hand side uh, between the 15th of June and the 17th of August when he was admitted to a hospital in, in Philadelphia. Um, he had, had obviously been hospitalized. Um, and so uh, that, was, that was two months. Uh, probably he spent more than uh, another month or, or so uh, in the hospital in Philadelphia. And when it asked for the post office address of his wife or nearest relative, his mother is listed. Uh, her name was actually Honor, H-O-N-O-R, uh, but it, it's listed here as Owner McLean, and he's from Carroll County. Um, so uh, we are very pleased to say, I'm very pleased to say that um, he, he was, able to recover. He married, had a family, and when his life was over, uh, he had several pieces of property that he owned and uh, had come out of slavery to, to own property in Carroll County. And, uh, and it was a, a success kind of story uh, after a very hard uh, couple of years in the uh, US Colored Troops. 
This is a very interesting photograph um, taken of recuperating soldiers at one of the, uh, and they were all segregated hospitals uh, during the Civil War. So this was a hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, the two men on the left uh, obviously are musicians. In the original um, or in the photograph, uh, this doesn't show here, but each of these men uh, was named and the unit in which they were serving um, the arrow points to uh, young Adolphus Harp, who was from uh, Eastern Frederick County. And he, uh, uh, after the war, he survived the war and uh, went to live in Baltimore. But his brother, Benjamin Harp, uh, came to live in Carroll County. And uh, so this, this picture, does give you a good idea of, of perhaps the way these men looked as they were recuperating in one of the hospitals. One of my favorite stories that I ran across is, is that of a father and son, Henry and Joshua Dutton, um, both of whom were, were slaves of Nathan Gorsuch. And the, the map on the left-hand side of your screen shows where they lived in uh, Woolery's district along Nicodemus Road uh, in the Bird Hill uh, Gamber area. Um, and Henry Dutton, the father, enlisted when he was in his late 30s in the 4th U.S. Colored Group. On the right hand side, the image shows what he did uh, during some of the time that he was in the um, fourth US Colored Troop. He was a guard for a while at a smallpox hospital. Um, halfway down the page, you see on extra duty on the canal at Dutch Gap. So uh, lovely kind of jobs going from a smallpox hospital to digging that ditch uh, at Dutch Gap. And then he was involved um, in the Battle of New Market Heights on September 29th of 1864, the same one in which um, Alan Toop was, was killed. Henry Dutton was not killed, but he eventually died of his wounds uh, about um, 40, 45 days after uh, the, the, the battle took place. So it left his wife, Maria, and three uh, minor children um, without him coming home. Very lucky uh, for, for Mariah, Gilly, uh, Mariah Dutton, excuse me, uh, that Nathan Gorsuch, who, who owned both uh, Maria, her husband, and uh, her, um, her children, they had information to prove her marriage to Henry, to, to prove the birth dates of her children. And so she was able to get a pension, which was often very hard for African-American women to, to prove those kinds of, of things that were needed in order to get their pensions. So she got an $8 a month pension plus $2 for each of her minor children. Uh, and, um, and continue to live uh, either on the, the land <clears throat> that Nathan Gorsuch owned or uh, nearby. Joshua Dutton was the, was the son of, of Henry. He enlisted in a, or in a different um, a unit. Um, he was in the 30th US Colored Troops. But we see on the right-hand side some of the information that uh, was required when a slave owner um, agreed to have his slave enlist in the army. Um, first of all, he had to, the slave owner had to manumit or free his, his slave. Secondly, he had to provide evidence of the, the title to that slave. When did he uh, come into possession of him? And thirdly, he had to uh, prove his loyalty to the union. Uh, so he had to, to find people to support his, his loyalty. If 
if he did those three things and his loyalty was was assured, he could receive up to three hundred dollars from the uh, U.S. government um, as recompense for for the release of that slave. And what you see on the uh, documents here are revenue stamps. The U.S. government started charging uh, for these documents, and the money that was raised uh, went towards the war effort. So it was uh, was very interesting. Uh, not too long ago, I was contacted by a descendant of Joshua Dutton, um, and uh, it, I asked him a little bit about uh, what he remembered of his ancestor, and he said, um, "We never we never talked about we." Uh, I don't didn't know that he had been a slave, or that his father had been a slave. We we did know um, just that he was sort of a grumpy old man, um, and I took a look at the 1920 census uh, at what uh, the age was of Joshua Dutton. He had married very late in life. Uh, he's listed in the 1920 census as age 75, maybe he was 73. He has a wife who's only 34 years old and he's got six children. Um, so uh, it seemed to me that um, he, he perhaps could have come across as a, a grumpy old man um, to, to the children that were in that household. Uh, but that, that's what uh, was remembered about um, Joshua Dutton by a, uh, the descendant that that uh, contacted me, and I was very appreciative of of the fact that unfortunately the descendant had no pictures of Joshua, but uh, did have uh, some family stories to share. We have a, a couple of men here who were in the United in the uh, United States Navy. I'm just gonna cover two of them. I found about five, I think. Uh, Henry Howard, who had the rank of landsman, which was just one rank above uh, the lowest in the Navy. He had been a slave uh, of a, uh, a man named Upton Scott who lived in Western Carroll County. And when he enlisted in uh, the Navy in 1863, one of the boats uh, to which he was assigned, one of the ships was the USS Mahaska. And I did find it, this great picture here. Uh, the Mahaska is in the foreground um, and it was a gunboat. It was um, used by the Navy uh, as a gunboat on probably, this, this is probably taken or, or drawn on the James River or one of the other tributaries uh, uh, that leads into the Chesapeake. So it's supporting the infantry in, in shelling the home of a, a rebel. It had been a, a ferry boat and um, the United States Navy when it, it started, when the Civil War started only had about 40, 42, um, at that sort of range. Uh, active uh, ships that it could call upon. But, but by the end of the war, luckily, uh, they had increased that to over 600. Um, they were taking old whalers and, and ferry boats and all sorts of, and, and building boats too. Uh, so the Navy went from about 40 ships to over 600. Uh, one of the, the amusing things, at least to me, was that when Henry Howard, um, his, his three years of service in the Navy was up, he re-enlisted. Um, and um, so he must have enjoyed uh, what he was doing, uh, certainly perhaps better than what he had been doing as a slave of Upton Scott, but he would be free. One of the pieces of, of information showed that um, Henry Howard now was a, a true Navy man. He had a um, crucifix tattoo on one arm and he had a woman's uh, face or body on the other arm. And so uh, to me, it seemed like he was um, a full-fledged sailor and uh, maybe that's a bit of, of uh, silliness on my part, but uh, it, it just seemed uh, as if he bought into the, the Navy idea. 
here's another man uh, from Carroll County uh, who started out as a um, enlistee in the uh, 30th U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, his name Benjamin Cramp Crampton. He had also been a slave. Uh, Carroll County shows he was a laborer. This is not a picture of Benjamin uh, Crampton. Uh, this is just uh, someone I found, but this is the uniform that a landsman in the US uh, Navy would have been wearing. Um, he was transferred from the uh, 30th Colored Infantry to the Navy um, shortly after he enlisted. And one of the ships that he was uh, assigned to was the USS uh, Osceola. That ship uh, would have been part of the North Atlantic blockading for, uh, squadron. And in November, December, January of 1864-65, that ship was involved in the bombardment and eventually the capture of Fort Fisher off the coast of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. It was the, Wilmington, North Carolina was the last Confederate port on the East Coast that hadn't been uh, captured by the United States Navy. And it was uh, actually two battles in which um, there were efforts made to, uh, to capture it. It was not just a naval battle, there was also um, infantry involved in, in the uh, in the attack on Fort Fisher. Um, so Benjamin Crampton, uh, I don't believe he re-enlisted, but he was uh, he was a sailor. The, the jobs of the sailors on these ships um, was, uh, of black sailors, was never to be part of the, uh, of the crew that was manning the, the guns, probably. Uh, they may have been shoveling coal into the, uh, the furnaces that were were uh, where steam power was was required, or doing a lot of of manual labor, but um, it, they had a, a rather low rank and so would have been confined to doing rather laborious sorts of things. I had one other name listed here: a man who was in the. Um, uh, U.S. colored troops in the cavalry. He came from from uh, the Tawny Town area, but I'm not going to discuss him because I want to discuss two men who, at the end of the war, came home and um, were very active in their communities. And uh, so the first one is Simon Murdoch. If you take a look at it, the dates. Uh, 1838 to 1933, this man lived to be 95 years old. He was in the uh, U.S. Colored Troop, 4th U.S. Colored Troop. He had a brother uh, also serving there. Um, you can imagine these man, men came home. They were probably heroes, um, and they had seen so much of the world. Uh, so much more than they would have ever seen uh, if they uh, had had stayed home in their small black communities. Uh, when he, when Simon Murdoch came home, one of the things he was working very hard toward was the uh, was was getting better education for uh, black children in Carroll County. Um, he also was very involved in the Methodist Church, and he gave land for the uh, Strawbridge Methodist Church that's on Route 31 outside of uh, New Windsor. He was commander. Here he, he's shown in this picture in his GAR uniform, the, the Grand Army of the Republic, and he was commander of the uh, segregated Thaddeus Stevens uh, GAR post in New Windsor. Um, and what's to me one of the exciting things is I found his name listed as a qualified voter in 1873. So he was taking advantage of the, uh, the rights that he had earned um, as a uh, hardworking, uh, hard fighting uh, man in the, in the Civil War. And he was definitely a pillar of his community. 
the last man I want to talk about, uh, and and here is, uh, we have very few pictures of any of the African-American soldiers from Carroll County, uh, but here we have a picture uh, of David Brown as a very old man. Um, he, like, like Simon Murdoch, became a pillar of his community. Um, he uh, was a trustee of the, the local school. He was a preacher at Western Chapel Methodist Church. Um, on the right-hand side here, you see a picture of uh, the gravestone where he's buried at Western Chapel Cemetery. And um, there is not just his name on this, this monument, but the name of Charlotte Toop also appears. Charlotte Toop was his mother-in-law, and she's the woman, the, the mother of um, Alan Toop, who was killed in the Battle of Newmarket Heights. Um, and uh, she was the one who received the $2,100 check uh, for uh, uh, the pension that she was owed by the US government. So this, this concludes what I wanted to say uh, about certainly with 125 men, I couldn't cover all the stories by a long shot, but I do have a, uh, a large book uh, where I have written down uh, and uh, collected as much information as I can about the, the men that I uncovered. It, it's going to be available in the library of the Historical Society uh, and hopefully that'll be open um, when, when this pandemic is over. I, I found this, this is not one of the um, US Colored Troops wh which had a lot of, of men from Carroll County, but the, the story, the, the wording here, let soldiers in war be citizens in peace, seemed to me to be just what um, we hope for. I see that Sam Riley has a question. Can you ask Mimi to tell the story about her work with the Brown descendants? Can you talk about that? Um, On the Western Chapel Cemetery. Yes, yes. Um, at at uh, uh, Christmas time, just before Christmas, we uh, some of us were involved in putting wreaths on the graves of of not just Civil War soldiers, but of um, all the the soldiers who were buried at at Western Chapel Cemetery. But one of them um, was uh, uh, Mr. Squirrel, and um, then also uh, David Brown. Um, and we're not quite sure, but we think that the person who is has been managing the cemetery um, and taking care of it for so long is probably a descendant of David and Brown. Um, so it, it, that was fun. That was fun. Um, and um, Sam Riley talked a little bit about uh, uh, Alan Toop and, and his service during the, the war. Thank you very much, Amy. Are there any other questions for Mimi? And if you don't have a question now, you are welcome to always get in touch with Mimi through the Historical Society. She's happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Um, let's see, Mimi, we're getting a few questions here by chat, which we'll get as many as we can in our remaining few minutes. Um, let's see. Um, let's see if we have another question here. Uh, trying to read this chat here. Um, hold on. Uh, no, we're just getting a lot of thanks. Uh, Sam Brainerd uh, sends his thanks. Um, if anyone else has a question, you can either use the chat or you can actually unmute and um, ask Mimi the question directly in the few minutes we have left. So, uh, Here's someone, P-E-E-J, I don't know who it is, looking forward to the next one on Black History. Thank you, and um, another thanks. But are there any other questions? If you have a question, feel free to unmute and ask it directly to Mimi. Uh, question, uh, will you be publishing this, Mimi? Will you be publishing this? 
Um, no, uh, but but there is. I do have this this huge uh, notebook in which I've assembled all the information that I could find about these men, um, approximately 125 of them. And I'm sure that there are going to be more discovered um, by other people. And I know that uh, Dan Hartzler uh, has been doing research on African American troops. Um, who served uh, from Carroll County. Uh, so, so this is, is just the beginning. And uh, I think people need to look, um, keep looking for more information that comes to light. But if anybody has photographs of some of these men, we would really love to have them because we only have three photographs or actually four photographs, but of three different men um, that are in the collection of the Historical Society of Carroll County. And, uh, and it would be lovely to have more of them. Mimi, we're gonna ask one final question before we run out of time, but this is a very good question posed by Kristen McMasters, who is our fabulous uh, interim executive director. And she said, can you, Talk about the depth of various resources that you consulted so that if people want to get started on their own research, they can get an idea of what they would need to do or what they could find. Well, that, that is a good question. Uh, certainly, um, I, I subscribe to Fold3, which is an online uh, database of military records, and, and that's uh, where I found a lot of this information. And then Ancestry or some other worth of the census records, um, went through a lot of, of newspapers because uh, you could find obituaries that mentioned that so-and-so so was um, a, a former uh, veteran or was a veteran of the Civil War. Uh, so yeah, you just have to comb, comb, comb through all the information. I did see something there from uh, someone who's a descendant of John Wesley Cole. Yes. yes, John Wesley Cole uh, is one of the few men we have a picture of. So yes, the storm, um, John Wesley Cole, um, uh, Simon Murdoch and David Brown are the only three men that I know who uh, were, uh, we have a picture of. And also David Bowie said a description of the CT form from Tawny Town can be found and he sends an address. Um, which is Carroll County, I mean, the Baltimore Sun um, lifestyles. Uh, you can see that, everybody can see that on the chat if you want to try to cut and paste that address. All right. And Dave was one of, one of the helpers. He and I uh, were involved with some of these soldiers from uh, Tawny Town, and uh, there were six, seven of them uh, buried at, at uh, St. Joseph's Church in, in Tawny Town, uh, St. Joseph's Catholic Church. Well, I want to thank you again, Mimi, for a really superb presentation. And another person that I would like to thank is uh, Bill Palm. Bill is a uh, very, very uh, serious uh, library volunteer at the Historical Society and does so much for the Historical Society, including helping us today because Mimi is using Bill's computer. And we are so thankful that Bill is willing to share his important tool and help us uh, make sure this presentation is looking its best. So thanks again to Bill, Mimi, and the Community Media Center uh, and the Nonprofit Center. All It takes a community to put this on, and we're so thankful. So thank you all very much. This will be streamed and um, made available um, in other ways through the Community Media Center. And we thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to having you join us for another event. Thank you. Thank you.